everyone. I'm Kiran Pardeshi, manager at Pune International Center. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all. May I request on the stage Shri Nitin Gokhale, the speaker for the lecture today, Dr. Dilip Padgavkar, chairperson of the program, and Shri Prashant Kirpane, the director of Pune International Center. Thank you. So as a usual practice, uh, we could go back to our smartphones and other phones and get them switched off even before we begin the session. Thought we'd allow a few seconds for that. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce the uh, speaker of the day today, as well as uh, introduce the chairperson of the program. While I know him well and some of you would know, but it's, uh, it's important that for many people who are attending the program for the first time, I do this present meeting. Dr. Dilip Padgapur is the chairperson of the program. Uh, he is also chairperson of the program committee at Pune International Centre. <coughs> Some of you would know him as the R.K. Lakshman Chair, Professor at the Symbiosis International University in Pune. He is also serving with the Times of India as uh, he is associated with them as consulting editor and many of you would know that he has served with them as an editor for a long period. Dr. Padgavkar is also on the editorial board of World Post. It's an online publication jointly partnered by Huffington Post and I hope I pronounce it right, Bergruen Institute of Governance. Uh, he is a prolific columnist and TV commentator. He has edited several books. The last but not the least, I must mention that he has the France's, France government's, French government's highest civilian award, award for his contribution to journalism and India-France understanding. Um, thank you. And I'm not daring to announce, to, to pronounce French, you know, because my French is not horrible. And I'm definitely going to make the mistake, so I'm not uh, saying the French. Uh, it's uh, it's pleasure, sir, that you could uh, you could join today to uh, chair the session. Also, an honor to introduce a good friend, uh, Mr. Nitin Gokhale, who has uh, agreed to uh, to speak today on a very very interesting topic. Mr. Nitin Gokhale is a renowned author, strategic affairs analyst, media trainer, and founder of a specialized website called BharatShakti.in. This portal is focused on supporting and encouraging India's quest for self-reliance and defense. Mr. Gokhale has worked for long three decades in media and many of you know him as the journalist. He has, been, he has written numerous books and they all focused on areas, domains of insurgencies, insurgencies wars and conflicts. He is currently working on a book on popular history of the 1971 war. He is a popular speaker and resource person at various seminars and symposiums that are focused on civil military relations, insurgencies, terrorism <coughs> and military media relations. He is a visiting faculty as you would imagine at the uh, Army, Navy and Air Force War Colleges the Defense Services Staff College and the College of Defense Management. Out of the 32 years that he has served, two long decades have been served in the Northeast and hence interest in the topic today and, and hence request to him to talk about the topic today. Many of you know that uh, as he appears on the national television as a commentator and writes regular columns on popular websites besides running his own blog titled News Warrior. Please uh, join hands to uh, welcome both Mr. Nitin Gokhale and Dr. Padgavkar on the stage. <laughs> to begin with, may I request the chairperson to uh, please give some opening remarks and thereafter we'll request the speaker. Thank you. One of the first lessons I learned about the Northeast was when I had taken over as the editor of the Times of India 
and I met uh, two young people from that part of the country who came to my office and said, the only time India takes notice of us is either when we join the Republic Day Parade in the capital or when we shoot at your soldiers. I think that particular remark told you about the kind of neglect, certainly as far as the media is concerned, but also neglect on the part of the entire political establishment to what is surely one of the most important regions of our country for a variety of reasons. That particular remark then led me on to formulate something which I have formulated only recently, namely that the core of our security interests lies on the periphery. And when I say periphery, it is partly geographical periphery. We've seen this happening in Punjab, we've seen this happening in JNK and in the Northeastern states. It is also on the periphery of many of our states, because if you see the kind of mouse insurgencies across the belt, it is largely in those areas which happen to be on the boundaries of various states. And increasingly, it is also on the social peripheries of our society, where you've got some of the greatest concerns. And uh, a mention has been made about the website that uh, he runs, bharatchakti.in. I think anyone who is uh, uh, is interested particularly in defense related matters and defense production matters would uh, learn a great deal from from this. Uh, also, Nitin has been uh, a prolific writer of blogs and I would urge those of you who are not familiar with his blogs to do so. It's called News Warrior. And um, in News Warrior, what is of interest is that each blog I think gets him the kind of reactions that very few other blog writers get. These are very informed uh, views expressed by serving and retired officers of our armed uh, forces. Uh, I'd also uh, like to say that the topic that uh, he's going to speak about today has gained in salience after, I would say, the election results in Assam. I think there would be a turning point in many, many ways, and I'm sure it's going to speak about it. But the fact of the matter is that the uh, outcome of this particular election in Assam, for me at least, heralds a period where the rest of India has finally sat up and take notice of the enormous challenges and opportunities in the entire Northeast. Uh, not that previous governments have completely neglected that region, but surely with the advent of the Modi government, if you take a look at the number of visits that have been made, uh, not just by the Prime Minister, but by his cabinet colleagues uh, to that part of the world, it will tell you that the big focus there has been really on development and particularly development for connectivity. And as uh, late as two days ago, there are a couple of news items which I thought were very revealing in this regard. One is that India has now started work on building a bridge over the Fini River in Tripura to ferry heavy machines and goods to and from the northeastern states and from the rest of India to the Chittagong International Port. Um, similarly, work has been speeded up on of the Northeast Frontier Railway, where it's been extended to broad gauge, and those tracks will then move on up to the border town of Sabroom, which is linked to the Akhar railway station in Bangladesh. Several other road building activities are moving apace in the region. In the meantime, I think uh, the governments are also making sure that um, connectivity uh, 
internet connectivity is, is also expanded. So this combination of the political serials that the Northeastern region has got, the reason declarations of the Prime Minister, namely that the bigger vision is that given the extraordinary national beauty and the ethnic diversity, the cultural diversity of the Northeast, this could become one of the prime attractions for world class tourism. I think all this put together tells you that today's topic would not have been more topical and you would not have had a more articulate and a more lucid speaker to tell us about the opportunities and the challenges than Nitin Gokhale. Thank you very much. I feel flattered, really. And thank you very much for that, uh, all those mentions. Uh, I was extremely lucky, I must say, uh, to spend time in the Northeast. I went there uh, on a holiday. My father was in the army. He was posted on his last posting in Guwahati in 1983. I am a Pune boy. I was in Wadia College uh, doing, I had done physics honors and was waiting for my results. And that's how I went to, uh, went to Guwahati after the uh, exams, thinking that I'll join the Air Force. Uh, I got through the Air Force that time. And I thought uh, we will uh, then, you know, spend time six months there. But as uh, destiny had it, I really couldn't uh, join the Air Force for, because my results got delayed. And um, then, of course, uh, which had just began about uh, 15 days uh, before I so went and appeared for a written test that they had asked for, for trainee sports journalist. I was a keen sportsman in college and school. So I thought, let me, you know, uh, while away my time for six months or so. That's how I went and joined the Sentinel. And within about four or five months, I liked the profession so much that I never went back to giving any other exam or any other competitive. Uh, spirit and competitive exam to join the Air Force or uh, look at any other career. And uh, serendipity has been the, the common thread in my life uh, and therefore I stayed on. My parents came back, my father retired from there and he came back to Pune and I stayed on. And stayed on uh, not just for one or two years or three years but 23 years. Uh, and I, 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 I call myself more a North Eastern than uh, a Maharashtrian. Uh, because I spent, uh, I, I, I joke with people that I went there as a 20, 22 year old boy, came out as a 46 year old man uh, when I left the Northeast. <laughs> so uh, that's how it began and you got with my uh, bio data so I'm not going to bore you with that. But I just wanted to give you one uh, overview to the people who uh, may not be very familiar with the Northeast. Uh, some of you I'm sure have traveled. This map is of course wrong, so don't get me wrong, this was the best map uh, I can I could go, get ready to depict both the northeast as well as Myanmar and uh, in, in China a little bit there and because the POK is uh, not shown in uh, India so don't get me wrong it's not a deliberate I mean it is deliberately chosen not for POK but for the uh, thing that, that has been given there so and I know that there are many of uh, many small words who are sitting here who have a very sharp eye to notice this so I thought I might as well give a disclaimer before that. Uh, so, if you really look at uh, Northeast, and I don't know if we have a pointer, it doesn't matter. Um, if you look at the Northeast, and if you look at this area, this entire area, uh, where, uh, which is, and this is Bangladesh, my India, in between. In fact, if you look at this area, and now Bangladesh is in fact Northeast locked. Uh, in fact, that is their uh, eternal uh, sort of complaint that we are northeast locked. Despite the uh, uh, despite the board that they have, uh, they are locked from north by the northeast from three sides, and all these small small states which actually are connected to the rest of India by what is popularly known as the chicken's neck, the Siliguri corridor, which is uh, about 60 kilometers by 20 kilometers, uh, 20 kilometers in uh, breadth. 60 kilometers in length, which is a very tenuous link to the rest of the country. Now mm -hmm. that has been the uh, major problem uh, with the Northeast. In part, during partition, uh, the western states like Punjab and uh, of course uh, Jammu and Kashmir in, in Northwest suffered uh, in terms of uh, casualties, in terms of bloodshed, but uh, they did recover 
uh, in due time. But the Northeast uh, actually uh, has taken a long, long time to recover because all its arteries, its communication, its uh, link to the uh, rest of the world, uh, outside world, uh, away from India, uh, Southeast Asia, as well as uh, the ports and the other links, got cut off during partition. It was extremely uh, arbitrary, as we all know, what civil right to did. And uh, therefore, all the links that the British had established to evacuate coal, tea, timber, through Chittagong port and through Mongla port, uh, were cut off. So the Northeast suddenly became the remotest part of the country, instead of being the outpost which could uh, go towards Southeast Asia, go towards Singapore, go towards Thailand was connected to Myanmar, all that got suddenly cut off overnight. And the consequences of that, the Northeast has been suffering for the last five or six decades. Because the tenuous link uh, that is there right now, the chicken snake corridor, if you just look at Tripura, for instance, if you look at uh, where uh, Tripura is, this one, and if you look at uh, Agartala, now Agartala if you uh, start driving from Agartala and you want to come to Calcutta, it will take you five days through this route, like this. In the, uh, in, before partition, from Agartala you could come to Calcutta overnight, in 12 hours. Now, that added to Northeast's problem. Now, of course, we are coming back to the transit rights that Bangladesh has agreed to give, uh, at least to begin with, for uh, goods and services, uh, not to passengers so far. But uh, that is now coming back. But the, the short point that I wanted to make as far as geography is concerned is that the Northeast suffered the partition, the consequences of partition much longer and uh, with much more devastating effect than did the western part of the country. And uh, that is not normally taken into account when we talk about Northeast. And uh, the British had actually established uh, all the linkages, the railway lines and the, the riverways Brahmaputra, uh, you could go through the Brahmaputra right up to Bangladesh and uh, you could evacuate your goods and you could import whatever you wanted. <coughs> of course, there was no imports that time. But uh, all that, those links were cut off. So, coming to the region per se, the seven states, although people are now talking about the seven sisters and one brother, that is Sikkim. Seven sisters are the uh, seven uh, states which are traditionally northeast. And uh, of course, uh, Sikkim, which is now being forcefully joined into what is called the Northeastern Council. If you look at the statistic and uh, also the map, the map is very interesting. Now, if you look at the largest state in terms of area, is actually uh, not Assam, but Arunachal Pradesh, which used to be DIFA, the North the Northeastern Frontier Agency, which used to be administered by the uh, the External Affairs Ministry for a long time and of course I, I don't dare to know much more than uh, many of the stalwarts who are from the administrative service here and from the government but uh, whatever little one has uh, seen and heard and spoken to people uh, NIFA was actually part of Nagaland uh, called uh, Tiwensam which used to be in NEFA was actually forcibly joined into Nagaland and the Naga state was created Assam of course is the largest state in terms of population uh, 3.1 crore, uh, and the rest are, of course, the populations are laughable in terms of the uh, numbers. Uh, look at Mizoram, it's uh, just about uh, 11 lakh. Uh, maybe one colony in Pune will have uh, 11 lakh population, one area or one locality. Uh, and uh, the area, of course, uh, in terms of, as I said, Arunachal is the largest. Uh, Tripura and Mizoram are right at the end of the, uh, the road or the end of the railway line. If you look at, this is the uh, place that you go through. And uh, this is Kim here. And this is the very tenuous uh, connection that the Northeast has with the rest of the country. So, uh, this is the setting as far as uh, Northeast is concerned. I also wanted to uh, sort of give you the idea of what has changed. And I spoke a little while, a while ago about the tenuous links. Now, under the uh, new sub-regional connectivity project called BBIN, uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India and Nepal, uh, new connectivity project in terms of uh, road motor vehicles agreement and of course uh, goods and transit 
all that is coming through. And you can see uh, this is Guwahati, this is Shilong, and uh, you know many. Uh, this red line is for the proposed uh, railway line, railway link going right up to Thailand. This is a proposed railway link, and uh, these are uh, the uh, crossings or the customs posts that are there at Petropol uh, and Pinapol between Bangladesh and India, and uh, these are operational already. But this is where a huge change is coming in. A huge change in terms of connectivity, in terms of bringing people together, uh, allowing trade and uh, commerce to flourish uh, after a long, long time. All this is going to change because of these connectivity projects. The multinodal uh, project of Sintwe, uh, the, uh, the trilateral highway between Thailand, Myanmar and India that is going to come through. And of course ADB is also building uh, a highway uh, for uh, connecting Southeast Asia through Myanmar uh, with the northeastern part of India. So many things are changing. If you uh, look at uh, the bus services that have began for some years ago, uh, the Dhaka Shilong Guwahati is a new one, but there has been a Kolkata Dhaka bus so far. Now, because the transit uh, rights have been given by this lady, uh, Sheikh Hasina, uh, now you will have uh, people going from Kolkata to uh, Agartala uh, in, in a matter of 15 hours, which uh, so far on the 47 is to take about 5 days by road. Uh, and so that is going to really change the face of uh, economy uh, in uh, Tripura. And uh, this was of course started, the Dhaka Kolkata bus service had started in 1999. Uh, the Agartala Dhaka bus service uh, started in 2003. But there was no connection between Dhaka and Kolkata and uh, Kolkata and, uh, and Dhaka and Agartala, which could bring people from uh, Tripura into uh, the mainland of India as, as it is popularly known, although I disagree with that uh, term because it's overused and it is also sometimes insulting to the people of the Northeast because uh, by using that term mainland and using Northeast as a whole, uh, as, as a term, uh, we are actually neglecting or we are overlooking uh, many of the different <coughs> different uh, uh, ethnic identities that uh, many of the ethnic groups there have. But we'll speak about that in a moment. Uh, also want to give you a little bit of, uh, this is my favorite photograph which is taken by me uh, many years ago. This was on the eve of 15th of August. Uh, this is a personal anecdote. Uh, when we came to uh, Delhi in 2006, my, uh, our elder son was uh, exactly 16 years old and he had never seen uh, in his stay, he had grown up there from nursery to last 10 or 11 and in Guwahati he had studied there. He had never seen an uh, Independence Day or a Republic Day parade as a public function because uh, it used to be always boycotted by the militants and there used to be a one call so people always avoided going out, although I went out as a reporter, I didn't take my family to the official functions. So when we first came to uh, Delhi in March uh, 2006 to stay, and uh, I said, well, let's go and see the uh, 15th August uh, you know, the function in uh, Red Fort. And when I took him there, his first reaction was, why doesn't this happen in Assam? Why doesn't it happen in, uh, in the Northeast? And it was very difficult to explain to him, of course, by the time he had grown up, so he had known. But uh, he used to always think that why uh, it doesn't happen in the Northeast. And that, this photograph was taken on the eve of uh, 14th August. This is the first bridge on the Brahmaputra, the Railcom Road Bridge at Sarai Ghat, just off Bahati, uh, where the river is there at, at its narrowest. And uh, it used to be a common uh, site and a common um, arrangement that the army would be deployed invariably to check for bombs and check for uh, any sabotage activity. And um, there used to be a 24 hour bun. So uh, this is the uh, popular uh, image that was projected uh, by many of us who were, who were reporting from there in those days. But I am thankful to editors uh, like Vinod Mehta who actually encouraged me to uh, do the late Vinod Mehta two different stories and I remember from the Northeast, uh, it, it might seem laughable now but uh, and of course Maharashtra is experiencing, experiencing the drought right now. Uh, there was a very rare drought in Assam 
and uh, in that drought, uh, there is an old system there where they marry off frogs uh, to uh, sort of uh, propitiate the, uh, uh, the rain gods. And uh, that uh, frog marriage was taking place in Kamakya. So I went and uh, asked my photographer to take the photograph and he did the story on how they were trying to uh, get the rain gods to uh, you know, come down uh, on, the, uh, on the state. Those kind of stories were also done in Outlook. Uh, that was a change that one uh, was uh, part of, uh, instead of just blood and gore or just uh, reports about insurgency and report about uh, military activities or uh, military campaigns. Uh, but to come back to the Northeast, uh, this is very uh, basic statistic. 8% of the land, 3.1% of the population. Now this demographic invasion which has happened over the years uh, in Assam, there are various contesting sides to it. Uh, but my own view is uh, that it's been going on even before independence. So it's not as if it started uh, as a, like a clockwork after 1947. Uh, the Britishers have written about it. In fact, uh, C.S. Mullen, who was the uh, commissioner of uh, census of uh, Assam, had written in 1931 that the East Bengalis, at that time East Bengal was part of India, of course, and what is Bangladesh now, uh, would outrun the local Assamese, uh, out, outgrow or outnumber the local Assamese uh, three to one, he had said. Assam had vast, empty tracts of land, very fertile land, but they didn't have enough manpower. Uh, and therefore, all these peasants, all these farmers used to come, and the uh, working hands used to come from East Bengal. So, the invasion that we are talking about is now we are talking about invasion, silent demographic invasion, is because of the uh, territorial boundaries that have been drawn post 1947. But the influx and the, uh, the movement or the immigration, uh, the migration of people from East Bengal has been a, a continuous phenomenon from uh, the 1900s. So it's not very new. But what is new in the Northeast in terms of uh, history is post 47, uh, the insurgency. The first and the longest running insurgency in, the, in Southeast Asia at least or South Asia, and perhaps the world is another insurgency, which began as early as 1954, and the army of course was deployed in 1956. So the armed groups are still active, they may be very small, they may be of just about nuisance value, but they are there in various states, and uh, therefore uh, they create uh, problems once in a while. Although the level of insurgency, intensity of insurgency has come down quite a bit now, uh, this has been talked about quite a lot about being out of sight, out of mind, away from national consciousness. I, uh, when I used to come come home uh, that time once a year, it was very difficult to travel from northeast to Pune. And uh, every time I came, there used to be the usual question by our relations and my friends who used to say, "What are you doing?" Uh, you know, in that God for second place, and they didn't know anything about it. Some people would ask, "So is Tripura the capital of Arunachal?" Uh, or uh, is uh, Arunachal uh, you know, uh, peopled by uh, Chinese or people of Chinese origin? All kinds of silly questions. So my only answer used to be, come and see there. I am there. You want to come and see, you want to travel, please come and see. Because I used to always chide my friends and relatives that you know more about Houston and Boston than about Kohima and Pokhara. So they used to say, yes, certainly we don't know much about uh, that region. So the national consciousness uh, wasn't there much about the Northeast, but it has changed over the last 25 years, I would say. And you would be surprised, uh, one man who has never given that credit uh, for changing the government's perception, if not so much about uh, the people's perception, uh, who gave much attention to the Northeast, was none of these uh, uh, very popular or uh, long-serving prime ministers, but it was H.D. Devagoda, who in 1996, spent seven days at a stretch in the Northeast in November 1996 and um, said that you know, we must give more attention, we must uh, have separate package uh, for the Northeast. Uh, he allocated funds, although the funds, uh, none of, not much of the funds came there and I don't want to uh, say something that will uh, be uh, easily caught, as a, uh, caught out as a lie by people like Mr. Kelkar here who was in the government that time. But uh, I know uh, the feeling in the Northeast was that the money never came. They, they used to say, some chief ministers, that the package has been announced, but they're now looking for the wrapping paper to be delivered. 
So, uh, but the perceptions have changed in, in that sense in the Northeast. People are now more aware of the Northeast. And uh, of course, now, uh, I would say, and uh, Mr. Komodo Khandega is here, uh, Anand Khandega, who had commissioned me to do a study about 12, 13 years ago of what are the uh, employment potential, what is the employment potential for various uh, sectors in the Northeast. And that time I had mentioned, and he just reminded me, that Southeast, it, Northeast is going to be benefited uh, by its geographical location. That is going to be a bridge, <coughs> or I would say even the springboard for India's uh, look east, that time the look east policy, now the act east policy. And I'm glad, <coughs> I'm glad that uh, it is uh, coming through. Uh, more and more attention is being paid to what is being done there. And uh, even the people of the Northeast have started realizing that uh, things have changed or changing. For years together, this used to be a representative picture of the Northeast. The romanticization of uh, insurgency, gun in one hand and uh, guitar in the other. And, uh, and of course, people of the Northeast do love music. Uh, they are natural uh, music, uh, uh, I would say lovers and uh, music players. Uh, they love their music, they sing, they, they, they are joyful, they are joyous. And uh, this is again a very, uh, you know, a photograph is natural. I had gone to one of the underground groups uh, camp and I saw these boys uh, just standing there and discussing between themselves with their gamusha, uh, that uh, typical Assamese, uh, what is, uh, actually it's a kuki uh, thing, uh, which is there, uh, the scarf. And uh, they were so young and uh, so full of life. And these are the young boys and girls who joined the ranks of the underground. Uh, but of course, they always had a guitar with them. So I always uh, used to show this as a representative image of uh, Northeast insurgency. But things have changed. Um, Northeast is of course also uh, rich uh, in natural resources. And these are some of the figures which are there for everyone to see. Uh, not my own figures. But um, the biggest natural uh, resource there is water. In Arunachal Pradesh, if everything is harnessed, of course there is opposition to big dams there, uh, although the dams are being now built at Subansari and um, Lohit and other places. Uh, the potential there is about 58,000 megawatt. And now that will take care of, I think, the entire eastern India and then, then you can export some of them to Bangladesh and uh, even to Myanmar if need be. But that's a potential. Uh, the potential hasn't been realized fully. Uh, of course, uh, forest cover is building, although compared to other parts of the country, forest cover is huge. Uh, limestone, uh, hydrocarbon uh, is also in pl uh, plenty there. River water, and Brahmaputra and uh, other rivers there are uh, full of water. Now, how to utilize that water, how to harness that uh, natural resource is something that the governments have been grappling with. But I'm sure there will be some answers uh, found. Just to come to uh, the current state of affairs, uh, as far as uh, law and order is concerned, Manipur remains, continues to remain uh, volatile. Uh, it has uh, the maximum number of armed groups there. Extortion, uh, ransom, kidnapping uh, is uh, widespread. And uh, somehow uh, that state, despite its brilliant people who are uh, lovers of art, uh, practitioners of uh, fine arts, uh, in terms of uh, theatre, in terms of uh, painting and uh, even uh, dance. Uh, the insurgency there uh, remains uh, widespread and uh, discontent is uh, still uh, very, very uh, apparent when you go there. They continue to have uh, very many incidents there uh, in, uh, in Manipur. Uh, Nagaland, of course, uh, is outwardly peaceful because uh, one of the longest ceasefires has been on there since 1997 with the dominant Naga group, the NSC and IM, uh, which is again uh, sort of uh, successor of the, uh, the original uh, Naga, uh, the FNG and the NNG, NNC of uh, FISO, who launched the insurgency in Nagaland. 
but their uh, factional fights uh, still go on. There are various factions of uh, militants there or insurgents of the Naga, Naga groups. Uh, the truce, of course, they signed that uh, framework agreement about uh, a year ago, but uh, not much progress has uh, happened after that. Actually, not a year ago, maybe 10, 11 months ago, August last year. And uh, beyond that, uh, nothing has happened. But uh, there is hope in Nagaland that people have moved on and nobody wants to support insurgency, nobody wants to go back to the days of uh, insurgency and counter-insurgency. So therefore, uh, there is hope in Nagaland. Assam is a classic case of uh, insurgency is rising to its maximum level <coughs> and the waning. Uh, that 20 year cycle has been uh, completed in Assam, the classic military uh, definition of insurgency. And of course, now you have a change in government. Uh, for the first time, the BJP has uh, really uh, gone and expanded itself from uh, just uh, four seats in the last assembly, uh, state assembly, they have uh, won the majority, or uh, they are close to 60 seats uh, on, their, uh, by, on their own, and with allies, of course, they are in power. Uh, so that's, that's a major shift as far as political uh, equations are concerned. The AGP, the Assam Gana Parishad, which was uh, born in 1985 after the Assam movement led by Prafulla Mahanda and Prabhu Bhukan, uh, is now a junior partner in this coalition. And uh, this is the wheels of fortune as far as politics, uh, politics is concerned. That a two-time Chief Minister, Prafulla Mahanda, is uh, sitting out and is not a member of the cabinet, uh, although the AGP and he himself has won the seat there. So this is the the way the politics uh, functions. Uh, and his, one of his young disciples or one young general secretaries, uh, Sarvananda Sonowal is now the chief minister. I have uh, had the occasion to see Sarvananda as a young student leader of the All Guwahati Students Union uh, way back. In fact, even Prafulla Kumananda, when I started off, was a student leader. He was the president of the All Assam Students Union. So, the wheels of fortune have come full circle as far as Prabhupada Mahanta is concerned. He's been the opposition leader, he's been twice chief minister and now of course uh, a little irrelevant in the politics of the state. Uh, Assam uh, insurgency is completely under control. Uh, there's one uh, faction of Paresh Barua uh, of the Ulfa which is still there. Uh, the other states like Tripura, Mizoram, Meghalaya and Arunachal have had various uh, varied uh, insurgencies but they're all now uh, peaceful and uh, they are all looking forward to development. Tripura is a very interesting case. Uh, it's been governed by the left parties uh, for a long time, but its uh, HDI and uh, its uh, other development indices have been much better than the other northeastern states. Uh, they were very lucky to have a very uh, efficient uh, and committed team of uh, bureaucrats. And uh, of course, uh, in Manik Sarkar, they have one of the most uh, simple and humble uh, chief ministers. And like uh, one of these uh, days when Arvind Kejriwal became the chief minister, uh, somebody spoke about his simplicity and all that. So I actually had to remind people in writing a column about a uh, gentleman called Ripen Chakravarti, who was the chief minister of Tripura. When I first met him as a young reporter, and I won't name the person who went with me, with, he was with India today that time, and I was a very young reporter. So we went to uh, Agartala, we landed together from Guwahati and we asked for an appointment. So he said, okay, both of you will be given the interview together. So this gentleman was a very senior reporter at uh, that time. And the first thing he goes and complains to Lupin Chakravarti saying, uh, your state capital doesn't have a hotel which has an AC room. What is this kind of a you know, uh, state you run here? So he was vivid. He said, come with me. So he walked and took us to his <coughs> Not a bungalow, but uh, a really uh, small house uh, where he had one trunk full of his own belongings, some books, and one small room where he used to stay. And there was no AC, there was nothing, and just blazing hot. So you know, that's one of the you know lessons one learned in early days. Uh, him, Brigadier Silo, Silo, was the chief minister of Mizoram, uh, 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 sort of veteran soldier turned politician. Again, very uh, simple man. In fact, I owe him a lot, Brigadier uh, Silo. I just wrote an obit. Uh, when he passed away, an obituary, where he gave me a lesson about uh, history. I went there as a 
young 22 year old boy reporting on Mizoram insurgency. So I was taken to him for an interview. So he looked at me, I was very skinny uh, that time. And he looked at me uh, from top to bottom and asked his uh, PR person, that, who's this guy? <laughs> so he said, uh, he's some reporter come from this newspaper called Sentinel. So he says, uh, he asked me, uh, what is a Gokhale doing here? So I was surprised first thing that he knew about a Gokhale. <laughs> so he said, look, uh, I was in the army and I've come across Gokhales in the army and the Air Force. So he said, what are you doing here? So I told him my usual story. Then he said, what do you know about Mizoram? So I told him, I said, insurgency has been on since 1966. And you know, I was, whatever I little I knew. He said, no, you don't know enough to interview me. He directed that uh, uh, Silo, LR Silo, his PR person who's still there, uh, who's now retired from uh, service. He told him, you take this boy, take him to the library, make him sit there for the next two, three days, and then come back to me. <laughs> then he can interview me. So that's how I stayed, and this was in January 84. I was barely seven or eight months into the profession. But these are the strong words I always remember when I speak about the Northeast. And uh, he gave a lesson that, you know, you must know the place before you go there. You must know the history and the geography of the place and the history of the people, all that. And then, of course, uh, later he really doted on me whenever I went there until he passed away very recently. Uh, Northeast has suffered a lot of neglect, as I mentioned. This is uh, a tribe in Arunachal Pradesh, a couple uh, sitting in a place called Tirak, district of Arunachal Pradesh, in the eastern fringes of Arunachal Pradesh. And uh, poverty, or uh, I would say lack of uh, infrastructure, lack of facilities, has really made Northeast uh, extremely uh, poor. Uh, the infrastructure has been uh, very poor there as far as connectivity is concerned, but as I said, things have changed. Um, the biggest problem has been in the Northeast, and these are again personal experiences misuse of uh, funds, the money that comes in. Uh, and money has never been a problem really and uh, at least uh, last 20 years that I have seen where the money has been coming in uh, through what is called the donor, the uh, department of the northeastern region uh, which was created uh, and where 10% non-lapsable pool of resources was created for the, uh, for the region. That means if, you, if your budget is uh, 1000 crores of the central government uh, for instance 10% of that budget will always be earmarked for the Northeast from major ministries, infrastructure ministries uh, and other ministries uh, in the center. And that uh, money will never lapse, it will just be carried on. That uh, pool was created and uh, so money has never been a problem even earlier. The problem has been the leakage of funds. The, the kind of siphoning off that happens uh, has, has happened earlier and uh, continues to happen in very many cases is something that, that is worrying and that is, uh, has set back the region uh, quite a bit. I know of one case, uh, for instance, uh, about uh, the FCI, the Food Corporation of India, where uh, the people of the Northeast normally are not uh, roti eaters. They don't uh, eat uh, wheat. They don't uh, need wheat really. They need rice. But uh, invariably, if you check the FCI records, at least till about 2007-8, uh, wheat quota used to be allocated to each of the state that used to be uh, supposed to be lifted from the mandis of North, uh, from North India and used to be transported to the, uh, to the Northeast. Now, uh, the wheat was never really transported. It was lifted from those mandis and it was sold off in the, uh, the private market or the, uh, the open market. Difference was pocketed by uh, people who actually dealt with all this. But more than that, they used to also pocket the so-called transportation cost. The wheat was never transported. <laughs> but uh, on paper, it was shown as transportation cost. And uh, those kind of things used to happen. Uh, or at least uh, in my tenure there, I, I remember many of these cases coming up. And uh, uh, then CBI trying to inquire, and nothing came of it. And of course, uh, one or two chief ministers have got prosecuted there. P. Ketungan's name comes to mind from Arunachal Pradesh, Gegang Wapang. Uh, was supposed to be, at that time in fact some of my friends, uh, I used to tell them that people talk about politicians uh, in Maharashtra being filthy rich and uh, loaded with money. I said, you haven't seen anything uh, like that uh, in Maharashtra. What, you, what I see 
uh, in terms of percentage, how much is the budget of a state and how much money is siphoned off and how people become rich, uh, like politicians there. But uh, that has been uh, the big pain of Northeast, the misuse of funds. And uh, because the money was poured into Northeast uh, traditionally, what it did was, this is the fallout or the negative side of the funds coming in, uh, in large quantity, was the division of the uh, hitherto uh, classless societies. Tribal societies were never about uh, who's uh, the upper caste, who's the lower caste, or in terms of uh, even um, in terms of uh, your status. There was no, not much uh, difference between uh, people there in the tribal societies. But because people became suddenly rich, and a class of uh, new rich people was created, uh, uh, the, the politician, uh, the, the bureaucrat, and the businessman. And uh, a new kind of nexus developed there called, I call it, uh, I sort of termed it as 60-40 nexus, where the, uh, the bureaucrat who proposes a project, uh, the politician who endorses that project, and the businessman who executes it on paper at least, used to divide the money 60-40. That means 30% to the politician, 30% to the bureaucrat, and 40% to the businessman. There have been instances of projects uh, being, you know, just done on paper and this money being siphoned off. So 60-40 nexus was a very, uh, is a very common phenomenon in many cases. But now transparency has increased, there's a lot of accountability and uh, that milking of the system is slowed down, fortunately. And hopefully it can't be eliminated, but it will be negligible in years to come, is what I'm hoping. Um, this has also created disparities within the region. If you look at Assam, uh, the upper Assam region of Dibrugarh, Sipsagar, Tinsukia, Jorat was uh, traditionally always rich of natural resources. And uh, that is uh, because of oil, timber, uh, coal, uh, which was uh, near uh, the Arunachal border. Uh, all that, the, the people there were rich, they were well off. But the lower Assam, which took the brunt of the uh, influx from Bangladesh and also faced many floods because the uh, Brahmaputra came down and went into Bangladesh. Before going into Bangladesh, it really wrecked a lot of havoc in uh, these uh, lower, Assam <coughs> lower Assam districts. And therefore, the disparities and the struggle between the two regions was also very evident uh, when you look at it uh, very closely. But incidency has also been a major problem in the Northeast and uh, it continues to linger on in uh, in some cases like I said in Manipur, in some cases Arunachal, uh, some of the uh, new groups are uh, sort of sprouting there. Uh, the extortion, the ransom industry uh, is roughly about 200, 200 to 50 crores where house tax is imposed, where the NSC and even now where during truce gives out receipts. Uh, to people for uh, levying tax or what is in our language extortion, in their language tax. And in fact, I have seen personally where uh, in uh, where various government office, uh, offices of the Nagaland government, the drawing and disbursement officer, uh, correct me if I am wrong, is called the drawing and disbursement officer, the DDO, used to be uh, in charge of collecting uh, money from everyone uh, at the beginning of the month at various levels of uh, taxation, 10% for the gazetted officer, 5% for the non-gazetted, and 2% for the uh, class 3 and 4. And that person was in charge of collecting the money and giving it to the, the local commander of the uh, insurgents. And uh, he, so it was like tax deduction at source. <laughs> there, there, is, there is no income tax for uh, many of these, uh, most of these states except Assam. Uh, all of these states are exempt from income tax, but they pay income tax like this, so they are not very um, not very comfortable. So, normal life, uh, there was a study done by, uh, there is a bank, small northeastern bank called Redfee, which had done a study, and I was part of that. We had done a study about bonds in the northeast, and we came up with a, a astonishing figure for a period of about three years between 1998 and 2001 where we found that out of 365 days, and you leave aside those 52 Sundays and 52 Saturdays, um, you had uh, working days, normal working days on an average in the Northeast, were not more than 93. 
because every day there was one one or the other uh, when you went from when you landed in Guwahati by the uh, at the airport and started traveling right down to Agartala or went right up to the river. You had one month or the other in some district, some ethnic group, some uh, disgruntled group having called a bun, which was total. So that affected uh, normal life, uh, productivity of course uh, got affected. Investors uh, never went there. I mean, there have been attempts for people to go there. Incentives were announced by the uh, central government, by the state government. Very few people went there. All that is now changed. Why am I telling you all this? I am telling you all this that from there we have come to a stage where most of the people have realized and this is the people's power. People have realized that it is getting them nowhere and therefore uh, many of the things are changing and of course these ladies that you see here are the uh, seven or eight grandmothers who had disrobed themselves in front of the Kangla fort in Madipur in protest against the Assam rifles uh, having uh, brutally raped uh, one uh, militant uh, young woman and killed her. Uh, this was in 2003. Uh, this became a very famous photograph. I haven't put the photograph of the uh, nude protest that had happened. Uh, there are several weaknesses still remain, uh, although, as I said, in the last three or four years, and I would say in the last two years, uh, thanks to uh, the Ministry of Road Transport, things are changing. But this is a highway between Shillong and Silchar. Uh, what used to be called NH44 uh, at one point in time. I and mean, monsoon invariably gets like this or worse. And uh, traveling uh, was always uh, an uncertain proposition wherever we went. Uh, what are the weaknesses in all these? The leakage of funds I have mentioned, lack of basic infrastructure of connectivity, unknown literacy. Literacy, uh, you know, a lot of people are proud to say that Mizoram is the second. La largest or second highest literate state in the country. Of course, you saw the population, it's about 11 lakhs. So it's no, no wonder that you know, all of them are literate. But if you go deeper down and look at uh, the numbers, then uh, nearly 70% of their boys and girls uh, drop out of school uh, at the stage of class 7 and 8. So it's a, it's a half-baked uh, kind of a personality that develops. That you empower them to think about their rights and their uh, entitlements, but you haven't empowered them enough or made them uh, aware enough to look at the uh, responsibility. And therefore, many of these people get into insurgency, get into drugs, and uh, that has created a huge issue as far as uh, the basic understanding of development is concerned. Uh, labor, why, why do the Bangladeshis come into the Northeast? They've gone right up to uh, the Brugat now, they've gone into, into uh, Nagaland. In fact, we, there was to be a general uh, there called, and many of the military stalwarts would know him. He just passed away, uh, General Sushil Pillay of the Assam Regiment. Uh, he had, uh, he and me once were at a seminar somewhere, and uh, we were comparing notes. And uh, he said, have you noticed uh, along Dimapur, which is the plain land of Nagaland, and where all others can go, uh, even from outside, outsiders from what they call India uh, could go. He said, have you noticed uh, a demographic change there? I said, certainly sir, I have seen. And all the uh, people who had come, they were all uh, Bangladeshi origin uh, Muslims who had come there. So he said, you know, I have uh, come up with a term. You may want to use it in one of your articles. So I said, uh, please tell me sir, I am always looking for something new. So he said, you know, there's a new class of people have been created or a new ethnic tribe has got created in uh, New Land and Dimapur on the plains of Nagaland. And he called them Semiyas. So I asked him, uh, why Semiyas? He said, there is the Sema tribe of Nagas and there are, uh, in a derogatory uh, sense, uh, the Muslims of Bangladesh origin are called Miyas. You know, Mia. So he says, they are the Semiyas, about 20 or 1000 people. The intercaste marriage, or marriage between the Sema tribes, women from Sema tribe and the, uh, the men folk from the, uh, the Bangladeshi origin uh, immigrants, they married and they created, a, uh, they have created a new community if you uh, want to really say it that way. So they are there. So there are various wheels within wheels, there are tensions uh, which are not seen on the surface. But, and you must have seen that uh, one man was lynched publicly in Dimapur 
uh, many of you would have seen it on TV and all that. It was all the suspicion of being one of those saviors and having been, uh, having robbed somebody or raped somebody, he was uh, publicly paraded and uh, lynched there. So, you know, those things have happened. The other weakness in the Northeast uh, is about the ownership of land. Most of the uh, Northeastern states, uh, land is owned by the community in Nagaland or in Meghalaya. So, if you want to set up something, uh, an industry or you want to give, uh, uh, have a factory there or a new setup there, the land laws are not aligned to the All India uh, norms. <coughs> Therefore, it becomes a huge issue of how do you get, so then you have to get somebody on board from that community. That becomes a matter of extortion sometimes or blackmailing and therefore nobody wants to go there. So that needs to change, the land laws there. Uh, and the other factor which I keep telling my friends in the Northeast is this, uh, and it, this was true uh, of having been neglected, having been you know, ignored by the center, all that. And people in Assam uh, still haven't forgotten what uh, Pandit Nehru apparently said uh, in November 1962 when the Chinese came at the doorsteps of uh, Deshpur where he said, my heart goes out to the people of Assam. They, they see that or they saw that as uh, Pandit Nehru abandoning them and therefore the sense of hurt that the Assamese had carried on till, I would say, till the uh, mid-1990s. But things have changed. People, more and more people are coming here. More and more people from uh, other parts of the country are going to the northeast. There is, uh, I have found people in Sangli, Satara, Hubli, you know, in smaller places like Velour, where uh, people have gone to study and stayed on, you will find uh, a very vibrant northeastern community in Pune. I'm sure uh, there is uh, almost 40, 50 thousand uh, strength of students and professionals in the northeast. So there has been a uh, quite a lot of uh, mixing of people. So that has changed. But the persecution complex in the amongst the politicians uh, still remains as a matter of convenience, and they continue to blame the centre. Uh, for their failures, for their uh, inability to deliver. And one of the uh, key, uh, one of the uh, case in point uh, I always cite, in 2004 and 5, the same Sarvananda Sonal who is now the Chief Minister, who was the uh, student leader, then became uh, AGP MP, then went back to becoming student leader, he used to constantly say in his speeches that uh, Assam's crude oil is being taken away and uh, we don't get enough uh, royalty from them, from the center. Uh, whereas, uh, from I think 2002 or 2003, four Assam refineries which were built over the years, Dikwo is the uh, oldest in 1880s it was built, and of course Numaligar was the youngest or the newest. Uh, combined uh, capacity of refining crude oil there had gone up to 7.5 or 7.6 million tons annually. Whereas Assam's own crude, product, crude oil production had remained stagnant at about 4.5, 4.6 million tons. So where was the, uh, the, uh, the remaining of three, 3 million tons of crude oil coming from? The old Baroni uh, pipeline which was built in the 60s uh, was used to pump back uh, oil which was brought from, the, uh, from uh, Haldia and uh, brought to Baroni and it was pumped back into something called Bangaino refinery where uh, the uh, oil used to come from outside. But the politicians conveniently kept saying that we are being exploited, we are not being given uh, enough uh, <coughs> royalty by the center. Whereas the situation was completely reversed. So that persecution complex about we being targeted, we being neglected continues there in, uh, in a section of the people and which I tell my friends there uh, as a sincere advice that nobody in Delhi has a time to target you or ignore you or it's just plain empathy and it's such a big country and Delhi is anyway heartless as far as uh, other peripheral states are concerned it could be Kerala, it could be Maharashtra, it could be anybody anybody else but Delhi's Luton's uh, zone uh, is of no consequence in that sense so persecution complex persists strengths of course are huge uh, in terms of the tribal ethos. Despite what I said about the division of societies having taken place or classes have been created in the tribal societies, uh, some of the democratic institutions in uh, states like Nagaland and uh, Meghalaya continue to uh, be, the, be the strength of the society. The democratic, uh, the democratic traditions of 
the electing people, or the Gaon or the village chief continues in uh, very many cases. The community land is owned by the community and uh, administered by the village chief. And uh, therefore, uh, some of these uh, ethos are uh, really worth following and worth building upon. Natural resources we have spoken about. Literacy rate, as I said, uneven but can be worked upon. Um, this is the biggest strength. If all these uh, projects that I mentioned, and they are coming through, and as they come through, if uh, they start connecting to Southeast Asia, more and more people travel out and more and more people come in. I think Northeast is poised to become one of our uh, vibrant hubs uh, or a region of the, uh, of the country which is uh, long been neglected, long felt neglected, which is poised to become much more developed and much more important. Because it's not just a, it's not just a bridge for India, between India and Southeast Asia, but I would think it's a springboard. And uh, it, it has all its, uh, you know, potential and all, all the uh, requirements are there in the Northeast. Now, what of the future? Just last two slides there. In 2014-15, uh, if you take the uh, budget of the central government and at 10%, and if you look at the donor ministry's website, about 48,000 crores was available for the Northeast for development projects. Look at roads. 600 kilometers of roads were built in, in the last two years. I mean, they were of course in the various process, but they are completed, if we say. Not, uh, it would be wrong for me to say 600 kilometers were built in two years, but they were built upon uh, from the alignments and uh, earth cutting that was done. Uh, in the next two years, 4,000 kilometers of roads are going to be built in the Northeast, according to the uh, Ministry. And according to Nitin Gadkari, who has been giving a lot of uh, emphasis and a lot of uh, focus and attention to Northeast. So once that happens, connectivity is going to be uh, tremendously improved. Uh, and as I said, from uh, what I saw as one flight from Guwahati to Delhi a day, one flight from Guwahati to Calcutta. Today, uh, just I'm talking only about aviation, civil aviation. Today you have uh, about seven flights from Delhi to Guwahati daily and about eight flights from Delhi to uh, Calcutta and of course in, intra-regional connectivity which has improved. Railways have reached uh, places where it didn't exist. Uh, in fact, one of the railway lines between Guwahati and Lamding and Silchar connecting Tripura and Mizoram and uh, Saran Asan uh, was built by the British in the 1880s and 1890s, the Lamding Silchar uh, uh, Mitagish uh, railway line. That is now being converted into Broadgauge. That is consequently brought in Agartala on the railway map. It is going to bring in uh, Mizoram as well as Manipur on the railway map. It is a tremendous change. So things have changed. Not that the previous governments didn't do it. It's just that the previous governments uh, did not hold the politician and the, uh, the implementers, the bureaucrats uh, accountable enough uh, to you know, get these uh, projects speeded up. Right now, everybody uh, who I've spoken to and I've traveled uh, in those places in the last uh, seven, eight months, Everybody is enthused with the kind of accountability, the kind of speed with which projects are being executed. And that's something uh, which is uh, you know, heartening and uh, something that we could look forward to. Funds, as I said, has never been a problem, even in the old days. But utilization of it and uh, siphoning has been the problem. The biggest advantage the Northeast has is the natural beauty, the tourism potential there. I mean, people haven't really seen the Northeast because there is no, not enough potential to go there. Uh, I mean, not enough incentive to go there. But that needs to be projected and I'm glad that the Northeast ad of Incredible India is also now all over the place. Uh, but for instance, I know it's politically a dynamite, but I always keep telling people that if you look at the road between Tawang and Dejpur, from where not the Chinese who came in uh, and sort of invaded Sela Pass and Bondila and Tawang, and came right at the doorsteps of Tejpur. But also the fact that Dalai Lama entered India from a place called Kinzamani near Tawang and traveled that road right down to Tejpur and uh, of course then came into uh, take his asylum. Actually for a Buddhist circuit, and I know the Chinese will jump at it and they will be very prickly about it, but the Buddhist circuit can be, that road can be called a Dalai Lama road and perhaps more and more Japanese and other Dalai Lama followers can come there. It's a, it's a thought. 
I'm not saying that it can be done, but it's a thought. Similarly, Brahmaputra, the cruise on the Brahmaputra, and one of my friends there has been running a luxury cruise on the Brahmaputra from Dubri to the Blue, 800 kilometers of the, of the Brahmaputra, which flows in Assam. Uh, and he's been extremely successful. All that he did was to target the British uh, tourists, high end British tourists. He charged them that time, I'm talking about 10 to 12 years ago, $250 a night on that luxury cruiser. And he would take them to Kaziranga National Park. He would take them to uh, some of the old Ahom Kingdom's uh, ruins and just give them a good time on the on the Brahmaputra, which is like a vast ocean anyway in, in Spain. So uh, there is enough potential. Uh, there is wildlife, there is adventure tourism, there is, uh, you know, for instance, Kaziranga National Park is the only uh, national park or a wildlife sanctuary in the world which has four big animals. They, they normally never exist together. Rhino, the tiger, the bison, and deer. They are all together. And in fact, the number of tigers in Kaziranga National Park is much more than many other tiger reserves. About 90 or 95 tigers uh, are there. It's known for uh, one owned rhino, but tigers are also in large numbers there. So there is enough potential uh, as far as tourism is concerned, but there needs to be circuits identified, enough infrastructure needs to be created, house stay, village stay, all that needs to be done. And uh, therefore, uh, that is one of the uh, important strong points that is there. Final point, trade needs to improve, as I said, between the states as well as between Northeast. And Bangladesh wants huge access to uh, the Northeastern market. Uh, we should grant them. And uh, some of their garments and their uh, you know, uh, the products that they do will find their intimate market in the Northeast. Road connectivity with the neighbors, with Myanmar and with Bangladesh and Bhutan and Nepal must improve. This trilateral highway, once operationalized, will I think boost the uh, free trade agreement with the ASEAN. And of course, uh, India is also going to be part of, or trying to be part of the RCEP. As I mentioned, BBIN uh, is now a successful project. Sub-regional connectivity, because SARC, uh, given the rivalry between India and Pakistan at the, at the apex level in SARC, you can never get uh, the connectivity, regional connectivity going because there's always differences between the two. So therefore, the sub-regional cooperation is the way forward. Power grid transit, in fact, Bhutan's power, excess power can now be evacuated through India to either Nepal or Nepal doesn't need it to Bangladesh and uh, further down. So that is, uh, can be worked upon. And the, uh, the final point here, uh, the influx is a main emotive issue and rightly so because jobs are scarce in, uh, in the Northeast and especially in Assam. I think uh, fencing is more or less complete. It needs to be tightened. It needs to be cleaned up of, cor of corruption and uh, made effective. Uh, whoever has come in, impossible to, to detect them because they have merged and sort of got uh, sort of uh, assimilated in the uh, SME's uh, landscape so much that you cannot detect and deport them. So uh, whoever comes in new or if you can't detect them, uh, if you know that they are new uh, migrants uh, by, uh, by their papers, if you can detect them, please give them work permits but don't allow the voting. And permits should be given to the new migrants only in groups because labor is required. Skilled labor or unskilled labor is required in the Northeast. Make, uh, make sure that they don't get voting rights because that's where the entire uh, imbalance comes in, in terms of politics. Uh, large scale uh, central aid, as I said, must go down to the grassroots. Insurgents should not be pampered, which has been a policy for a long time, that you uh, sort of announce a truce with them. And in fact, this is a term that has been uh, very unique to Northeast for SOO, suspension of operations. So what the hell is that? I mean, uh, either you have a truce or you have, uh, you know, a uh, fight with them. But suspension of operations and they continue to carry their arms, continue to extort, I think that should stop. The accords should come in time bond manner. And um, the final point I uh, sort of urge my friends in the Northeast always when I go there, I speak to them, that please come out of this mindset that the entire India, rest of India is out there to conspire against the Northeast. I'm sorry, nobody has the time to conspire against the Northeast. It's just that circumstances People, uh, people in power, people in power, in both in the center and in the states, 
as well as some of the uh, people of, uh, of the elite class uh, have conspired against the Northeast. So it's not just one section of the society or one section of the government which has uh, led to what Northeast has been neglected. I think things have changed and they have changed for the better. And once Northeast gets uh, fixed as I, as I see it in the next uh, three or four years, I think uh, we have a springboard to look east and not just look east but act east and uh, make that act east policy much more successful. I'm going to stop here and uh, then of course we'll have questions and any criticism or anything else. It will be request that if you could please introduce yourself very quickly and then ask the question. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me. My name is Brigadier Mahajan from CAS. My question to Nitin is about this illegal migration. Uh, the Modi government started off uh, checking them at the national population register. And it has been on for uh, since last about eight, nine months. And newspaper reports say that it has been, fa uh, been fairly been successful. So what is exactly the status right now and uh, this stateless citizen uh, and then of, uh, another announcement was made that uh, anybody who came after 72, uh, you know, their voting rights will be removed. So what is the uh, uh, progress on this issue? Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll take one or two more yeah, questions. Let's take a couple more questions, yeah. that will be easier. Uh, yes, come on over. We'll come back in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned about uh, large uh, population of students today uh, and from Bangalore, uh, Delhi, who are well educated, well skilled, but very rarely go back to their original states, just stay put here, maybe sometimes working in hotels or uh, malls and things. So I find lack of leadership, political leadership, hardly any chief minister from the seven sisters, you see them in uh, Pune or Bangalore or other places, trying to woo these people back again. Do think they can do back only if there is something worthwhile for them to do. So in that context, the projects that you did, uh, daily development and others, uh, I'm very happy to see that Amul is coming back in a big way. So I really feel that there's a lack of leadership, first of all, uh, political leadership. And then this big chunk of uh, uh, skilled manpower is being wasted. Sure. Thank you. My name is Brian uh, Danagare. I have three points. One is, would you like to comment on what is happening to the tea plantations, the tea economy? Because it was tea plantation which uh, invited migration of labor, both from Bihar and lower parts of Bengal and also today's Bangladesh. Uh, secondly, as a consequence of this immigration, there was a lot of anti-Bengali uh, anti uh, feeling particularly in uh, Northeast and in Assam. So would you like to comment on the immigration of Bengali speaking population having domination there? Initially they migrated in order to capture the tea plantations which were vacated by the Britishers. So this, this is my second point. And the third is, would you like to comment on the work RSS has done during the last 25 to 30 years in Northeast? Uh, tea economy, I'll just like to uh, make a slight correction there. The migration for tea uh, labor, I mean the tea laborers as they call it, in fact there is a separate tea tribe which is now got created there, was uh, brought in by the British from Chotanagpur and uh, Jharkhand and Bihar, all those places in the 1830s, 1840s. In fact the first uh, company or tea company, uh, Assam Tea Company was established in 1830. So uh, that was not meant for, and, and the, uh, the uh, migration or the, uh, the movement of uh, farmers or uh, workers from elsewhere, East Bengal did not take place in the tea garden community, or for, for tea, tea business. It was for farming or it was for uh, agriculture purposes, not for tea. So these two distinctions must be made. And uh, therefore, uh, today the tea tribe is uh, as strong as about 50 lakh population. And uh, Sarvangu Sonawal, in fact, grew up in one of the tea gardens there in Moran. Uh, so therefore, uh, they are now a vibrant community. They are politically aware, empowered. Uh, they are doing quite well. So uh, but the tea economy is really gone down in, as far as Assam is concerned. Uh, because the tea prices have fluctuated. There is uh, more competition from Kenya, from Sri Lanka, uh, and uh, even China. 
therefore uh, the tea economy on the backbone of Assam's economy is no longer tea. That is the reality. Uh, as far as um, RSS work is concerned, in fact what BJP is now enjoying the, the fruits of power is because of the work that RSS has done for the last 40 years or so uh, and very silently uh, have braved uh, assassinations and killings and murders of their own workers. Uh, they have gone uh, not just RSS but Vivekananda and uh, Kendra, Nangwasi uh, Kalyan Ashram. All these people have uh, fanned out to various parts and the remotest parts of the northeast. And they have worked and therefore this is now evident in the way BJP has come back to power. Of course propelled by anti-incumbency against Congress as well as uh, the fact that there is a BJP government in the centre. But that apart, RSS has done uh, a lot of work in the northeast, and uh, that is there for all to see as far as uh, RSS is concerned. Uh, over uh, Andekar's uh, point about students, I fully take it. Sir. We have tried uh, in very many cases, uh, one or two individual efforts. We have asked uh, chief ministers and uh, other uh, uh, leaders of the society to try and connect uh, those uh, professionals who are here, here in Pune or Bangalore or other places. It's largely been unsuccessful, but I'm hoping that with more conducive atmosphere back there, more incentives, more industrialization, all these people will go back. And so, who doesn't want to go back to uh, their own, uh, you know, own home? Uh, so therefore, uh, as I said, I'm hopeful of that happening, the reverse migration. And why just reverse migration? People like us should go and stay there and uh, work out and, and sort of give them uh, any help that is needed. So that I think uh, we'll have to wait for uh, for a while because. Those of us uh, who started this movement uh, continue to slog at it. Hopefully, we'll succeed one day. That is uh, there. As far as uh, Brigadier uh, uh, Mahajan's uh, question about NPR, NPR is doing good. They are uh, actually worked uh, quite hard in the last one year or so, even before this, this government came in. I mean, before the state government came in. Uh, and that is going to uh, really give us a clear picture of uh, all that it was needed even in the old days was to not have that IMDD Act in Assam, the Illegal Migrants Determination by Tribunal Act 1983. Uh, that should not have been there, it's, it was discriminatory. Now that this NPR is being implemented, I think uh, it's uh, quite uh, successful and it will give us a clear picture of who's who in, in Assam without getting into any bloodshed or any uh, uh, sort of upsurge. Uh, you know, or upsetting the uh, balance. So that's uh, one. I forgot your second question. You have something about uh, NPR or uh, about uh, the technical voting rights? Voting rights. Oh, that by is, the parliament. That proposal has been there, sir. Uh, but uh, that again, uh, we'll uh, we'll have to wait for the exec political executive or political leadership to decide. Uh, we can give it, uh, but we'll see whether anybody has the has the foresight and has the vision as well as the uh, the will to implement that kind of a proposal that has been made not by me but by many others uh, about uh, taking away voting rights but giving work permits. But let us see when it comes. I am not really sure it can come so quickly. Sure, thank you. Uh, my question to Nitin is this. In what time frame, if at all, you anticipate or visualize conditions or uh, <coughs> relations between India and Bangladesh improving to the extent that uh, they would allow unrestricted trade and transit facilities. And as a corollary, what kind of concessions would the Indians have to give to give uh, to get those rights from the Bangladeshis? Can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, Burma, Myanmar, and uh, both the cultural uh, accommodation and the economic insurgency there was that happened last year where there was a lot of reporting on that. I think, Kasturi, you can talk about that as well. Thank you. My name is Sanjay Kanwit, a member of PIC. Um, one of the things I didn't see mentioned was agriculture. Uh, we have heard a lot of talk in the last six months about potential for bio products and so on. And there's been a lot of buzz, a lot of seminars. Uh, the Prime Minister has talked about that. What I find very intriguing is today you can walk to the uh, local uh, Fruitwala at the corner of your street and he's selling apples from Washington and pears from Shenzhen and uh, I mean this is a corner guy you know and he's pushing those products so hard uh, I'll be very happy to buy products from Northeast but they're absolutely not available. Yes. yes, one of the major problems in the Northeast has been the evacuation of products and in a, in a speedy manner and uh, unless you have uh, 
regional, intra-regional connectivity or even uh, air connectivity to remote parts. For instance, there is something called a passion fruit in Mizoram or in parts of uh, Tripura, uh, which uh, can make uh, very good juice and you know, uh, other products. Horticulture products uh, are also there. There is orchids in uh, Arunachal Pradesh. But the time taken for transporting them or evacuating them from the region has been the uh, only constraining factor. And uh, therefore, I said that first things first, you need connectivity. So roads are being done now, which should be done in the next two, three years. Air connectivity, they have just given a new uh, policy where you can from small Cessna, eight-seater Cessnas can come in both for cargo as well as for passenger transportation. Uh, that is now being worked out by the uh, Ministry of uh, Development of the Northeastern Region. And uh, therefore, once all this comes in, I see no reason why that fruit uh, from there should not come to either Pune or to uh, go down to Chennai. Because uh, as I said, connectivity between major towns has increased or improved, or between Delhi and Bombay and Calcutta. In fact, there is a flight now from Mumbai to Guwahati direct flight which we used to pine for in, in the olden days, but now you can directly fly there. So, these things are improving, but it will take some time as far as agriculture products are concerned. Of course, Assam has a vast potential of agriculture otherwise, but other states have more potential. Coming to uh, Amit's question on uh, manpower and trade, uh, there is a lot of cultural uh, and uh, I would say historical similarities between Myanmar and uh, parts of Northeast, especially Manipur. Uh, not so much Nagaland, but Manipur and uh, Myanmar have some a lot of things in common. The other thing is what binds Myanmar and India is uh, Buddhism. I uh, happened to, uh, about almost two years ago, October, September uh, 2014, uh, I happened to uh, go for tourism purposes in Myanmar for, in the interior places like Inle Lake and Mandalay uh, uh, and uh, Pinyalun, uh, all those places. And invariably people would uh, stop us and ask, uh, are you Indian? First thing they would say, are you Indian or are you Pakistan? And uh, secondly they would say, are you Hindu or are you Muslim? And third thing they would say, Acha, have you been to Gaya? Gaya for them is like uh, what is uh, Varanasi or Banaras for uh, us Hindus in India or what is it for uh, Sri Lankans. So, but I find there is not much thought given to the connectivity from uh, Myanmar to Gaya. There is one weekly flight which comes from their side, whereas the demand is uh, for almost a daily flight which will go full. So all that needs to be worked again on uh, you know, uh, the similarities and the uh, traditional uh, bone homie that, is, uh, that exists between Myanmar and India. Uh, incidentally, uh, the uh, areas around India's northeastern borders uh, with Myanmar are actually uh, wild uh, places, uh, unpoliced. Uh, there is not much presence of the government there as far as Myanmar is concerned. And therefore, uh, insurgents take advantage of that and they have their bases there. In fact, I walked to one of them in 2003 with the UNLF. That fellow just got sentenced the R.K. Megan uh, from, uh, from UNLF. So I walked with him for eight days going into Myanmar uh, on the other side. So it's completely wild, there's no uh, control of the Myanmar government. So that is their problem. And uh, that is going to be very difficult to solve. And therefore they allow India to, you know, once in a while go across, raid the camps, or uh, you know, do all that with a tacit understanding <coughs> and continue to do that. That is the Myanmar uh, issue. Um, the issue of Bangladesh-India relations, I think, amongst all our neighbors except Bhutan, I think India-Bangladesh relations today are at, the, at their best uh, as far as uh, this region is concerned. Uh, Sheikh Hasina has done whatever she could do. Uh, she has uh, handed over insurgent leaders. She has uh, you know, worked on anti-terrorism uh, campaigns and anti-terrorism uh, policies. Uh, she has given uh, you know, at great political risk. Uh, this, uh, the uh, land boundary agreement has been done. So therefore, I think uh, they are at the peak India-Bangladesh relationship at this moment. India has given uh, Bangladesh what it wanted as far as land boundary agreement is concerned. Much against uh, what BJP stated policy was, was when, it's, uh, when it was in the opposition. Uh, some of the enclaves have been given uh, away uh, to Bangladesh just to settle that boundary. Uh, what more can we do where uh, borders will become irrelevant? I think we will not come to that stage if people are thinking of something like EU. Uh, it's not going to happen so soon, uh, despite uh, whatever one wishes. Uh, because there is a huge problem of the Jamaat in uh, Bangladesh and uh, anti-India forces within the Bangladeshi establishment, which will continue to support Pakistan and create 
another try to create another second front for India as far as northeast is concerned. So we have to be a little careful there and not go overboard about opening our borders or uh, you know giving free access to people from there. That is at least my view. But we'll see how it pans out. Sure. Hi, this is Darshan. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one was uh, some time back uh, we had a uh, uh, problem with in Bangalore where one North East student was being uh, The same thing sometimes happens in Bombay. So uh, there should be some suggestions to the public because it is not only the government has to do something, it has to be done by the public also. Means that there should be some acceptance level. Like in Maharashtra you said uh, so sometimes it happens that Bihari go UP based to Bihar based to. So if this thing is happening in, with Bihar and UP, then if the North East peoples are coming, then how should we accept? Or well, there should be some <coughs> message going on. Sure. Thank so, you. So uh, and the other one is as far as tourism is concerned, uh, if somebody uh, goes, suppose if because I am already doing in tourism in Kutch, but if in Kutch standing, I don't have any problem because uh, it's quite safe. But uh, are we certain that there will be safety because there is a lot of insurgencies and a lot of small groups, maybe somebody can uh, kidnap and have ransom and... Okay. Safety. Safety. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. 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 Like I mentioned about tourism, tourism is uh, very rich in terms of the forest and otherwise the terrain and other things. Uh, but I mean the Bumbila you mentioned, I mean the evergreen forest, what will you mean when you talk about it? Last week you didn't mention anything. Brahmaputra uh, every year travels, and the worst part is the the weighty building in the northeast. Uh, okay. All along the Himalayas and the park line goes all across in the Arunachal Pradesh. <coughs> Where I mean it could be ever. And then we can like mentioning about this the uh, roads cutting through in the four thousand kilometer. So that side has been another thing. Sure. sure, we'll take one last at the end. Uh, Hello. Hi. Uh, myself, Rock Lung Leng. I've been here in Pune for 10 years. And from where? Which state are you? From Okrul. From Okrul. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> one of the districts uh, yes. in Manipur. Yes. Uh, it's quite fascinating to hear a lot of those uh, facts and the factual, also the uh, concerns that you have shared. I have three things that which I would like to put forward. Sorry, just before the question, could you just talk for a minute about the association that you have here? What kind of people, how many of them are there in Pune? Just so that we have an idea before the question comes. Okay, uh, yeah. I, I came here in 2006, completed my uh, graduation from Ferguson, did LLB from MLS and Master in Law from Symbiosis. So I've been here for quite a while. Uh, since I landed in Pune, I've been involving with the community here uh, as a whole, not just the Nagas. But uh, in 2012, we, uh, we formed a community called Northeast Community Organization Pune, that's called NECOP. And I worked there for almost four years. And just last year, I was the, uh, one of the advisors. And now, yes, uh, the new team has taken up. Uh, we, have, we don't have a factual uh, the, uh, statistic, the exact number, but we, we probably might reach around 10,000 Northeasterners in Pune. Wow. 10,000, that's professionals and the students. Even particularly even Nagas, we have almost 2,000. So it's a huge community we have, though we don't really uh, have any sign of that, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, dominating community here. And we have uh, this from Manipur, Arunachal, from uh, Meklaya. Each state has their own union, that itself. So we work along and I think that has uh, that I mean, in that way, we connect each other, but in many ways, we don't really know each other. Uh, yeah, my question is, you talk about the emotion, the attachment, when you, uh, your, when you took your son to Delhi. I think, uh, in my personal perception, we don't hate, but there's no connection of our, you know, the emotion, being Indian, because there's nothing much on the good, uh, I mean, on the part of the, so to say, the main, you know, the, the mainland Indians, which when we grew up, we don't see that uh, happening, I mean, in our emotional life. So when I think of all this attachment, it's sometimes very hard to come to the point, how to really make, I mean, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to try to be more Indian, but I want to be, you know, I want to know as, 
I mean, I'm from India, and at the same time, that belongingness, that how to create. And so, personally, I think I, I struggle a lot, and not just me, I think the youth today uh, from Nordisk, everyone, almost all, will feel that if you go to Mizoram, Nagaland, you know, uh, Assam, or I mean, anywhere. Secondly, uh, we talk about so much about development, but still I'm so uh, critical about this because without peace, I, I don't see any things that being, you talk about the uh, leakage. I think it's, for me, the government of India has big responsibility to solve some issues that are still continuing since the independence of India without clarifying, without striking out that issue. So what are the steps that, as a young generation, on our part, also we have to respond? You being there for almost, uh, I mean, more than two decades, you might have seen the reality. And thirdly, I have a concern about the borders when we talk about uh, Myanmar in the border. Lots of tribes are living there. And these tribes, they have been divided into two communities. Though they are from one community called any particular tribe, but half of the tribes live in Myanmar, half of the tribe live in India, and when the government of India try to well, make some policy, that will always divide this tribe. So, what should be the response that the government of India and at the same time the young generation from the north is we should think? Lastly, one point. We have a huge number of uh, students across the cities in India, and I think <coughs> When you talk, uh, think about this, the future of Nordis, the future belongs to those young people who are living in the cities. And not just the chief minister, the politician coming to Pune, or Bangalore or Delhi, but what should the rest of the community should do to these young people so that people like us, we go back home and do something there so that we bring that, the changes that we really want to see as an Indian and as you know, the reason of this, uh, the India, the goal, I mean, the so-called Nordics. So that's what I fully agree with you that if you have to create a sense of belonging for the people of the Northeast, uh, there has to be an awareness not just at the government level, but at the uh, whole community level, the people's level. And I think, uh, you know, if you uh, really, when I look back and I think the awareness has really improved, uh, it, it can be improved much further. But uh, I am hopeful that uh, with all this, uh, you know, the trans migration that is happening between people of northeast and uh, people from here going to northeast in uh, larger numbers, I think uh, we are at a stage where uh, the understanding will improve, will increase, and the sense of belonging will also come. But for that, it's not just the responsibility of the government; it's also the responsibility of all of us to uh, be aware of the northeast, be, be uh, knowledgeable, a little bit knowledgeable about the northeast, and not treat northeasterners as something uh, people who have come from an alien land. Or because they just because they look different, uh, you uh, treat them as uh, you know foreigners or not Indians. That you know, needs to change. And I remember that uh, old uh, uh, incident which had happened with uh, Mr. Lalthanawala, who was the Chief Minister of uh, Mizoram. When he checked into Taj Bombay uh, about 30 years ago, he was asked for a passport. So uh, and then he said, uh, "Well, I am a Chief Minister of a uh, Indian uh, state of an Indian Union." So they didn't know at, at the reception uh, in the front office that there is a place called Mizoram. So things have improved from there certainly. Now at least people know that there are seven states in the northeast or eight states, and uh, there are these things happen because of the uh, explosion of media. The awareness has improved. Uh, more people have you know come this side, and more people have gone there. So I'm hopeful as far as sense of belonging is concerned, it will happen. Uh, as far as people going back, people like you going back to uh, northeast. I think it is again the responsibility of people, not just the politician or the uh, the, uh, the government there, but also the people. I am so glad that you at least have an association, that 10,000 people in that northeastern uh, community organization in Pune, uh, which I think all of us now uh, must reach out to them and see uh, what we can do, uh, how we can uh, actually work together in uh, improving the situation and uh, sort of getting more and more opportunities for people to travel there. Tourism, as you mentioned, can be a great unifier. And uh, even uh, people go for adventure tourism, so why not go there instead of going somewhere else? So that is your, as far as you are concerned, we can have a separate uh, chat on this, but we will talk about it. You spoke about earthquakes. I am not an astrologer, so I don't know what will happen to an earthquake. And therefore, uh, that's something that we have to live with, that danger. I, I, when I stayed there, people used to say, oh, earthquake is just coming. 1950 was the last earth, big earthquake. 
It's, it's round the corner. It's going to happen tomorrow, next year. People have predicted it hasn't happened. There are small earthquakes that keep happening. But we'll have to live with it. Uh, tourism, yes, uh, there are enough opportunities and uh, they can be... See, uh, there has to be a balance between uh, protecting the environment about roads, building, and that you're talking about landslides. Let us accept the fact that the mountains there are fragile, they are young mountains, and therefore there will be landslides. So, we can come around all that. I mean, today's technology enables you to do all that. So, uh, let's not be uh, too despondent about it. Um, safety. You spoke about safety. Uh, let me assure you that in the Northeast, uh, the insurgents will not touch an outsider who is a, who is a tourist, who is not a government official, who is not uh, somebody in power, who has gone there to do something. I can give you one experience of my own. Almost 15 years ago, my parents uh, said that uh, their bunch of their friends, all retired, 60 plus, want to come to Northeast and they want to touch all the uh, borders uh, which surround the other countries that are there. You, you know that 98% of Northeast borders are with the other countries. Bhutan, Nepal, China, Myanmar, Bangladesh, uh, like that. So they wanted to touch all those borders and to go to those final points, the border points. I arranged for a small minibus of uh, 18 of them and they went and they had one experience in uh, Manipur going from Imphal to Moray they were stopped by an insurgent group they said they boarded the bus and they said Pesa Nikal and uh, they started speaking in Marathi so one of the boys who had studied here in Pune and had joined the ranks of the insurgents he could recognize, he could understand Marathi he said so he asked them where are you from uh, what are you so when they said they are from Pune said no tourist ok so I'm going to escort you to the next point and I hand you over to the next insurgent group which is waiting there for, for extorting money. So they, they went, they never harmed them. So and that was 15 years ago. After that things have improved and uh, I'm sure that tourists will never get uh, really harmed there. And trade will of course uh, improve also as we go along. So I think I'll stop there. Sure. No, thank you so much. I think it's Well, little first and foremost, I must thank you for beginning your presentation by giving us an idea of the geography of Northeast. I believe that every time we speak about any part of India, we need to have a very clear idea of the geography of the place. And while doing some work on JNK, I remember a situation where I was told by some people in Jammu that they had written to the Home Ministry saying that uh, would you kindly sanction certain air conditioners that are required for a particular office? And uh, they were told in writing, why do why does JNK need air conditioners? <laughs> I mean, people go to JNK because of its food so climate and so on. Little knowing that Jammu is among can be among the hottest places in the country yes. in some. So first of all, thank you so much for beginning with the job. It's important to know exactly what the configuration is and this needs to be reiterated again and again because what followed in your presentation makes then a lot of sense. The need for example for um, physical connectivity, for connectivity on, uh, on, on the internet and so on and so forth. So I think the second follows and I'm very glad therefore that you began with giving us an idea of the geography, of the terrain, of uh, um, the, uh, the tremendous uh, ethnic diversity of, of the place, the large number of languages that people speak, um, also the kind of uh, uh, challenges that the region has to face, political challenges, uh, the insurgencies that you mentioned, uh, the kind of opportunities that are coming up, and of course uh, some things which are common to several other states as well. I mean, there's non-utilization of central funds, the leakages of money going, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think you've, uh, you've dealt uh, pretty well with these things. If we had more time, I would have loved to ask you a couple of questions. For example, you did very well to speak about the tremendous work that has been done very quietly um, by the, uh, the RSS. But I would like to ask you also about um, what the, both the, uh, the positive and the less positive um, impact has been of the work that Christian missionaries have been doing in the area for several decades now. You see, um, in fact, uh, if all of you must have noticed that in the past few years, one reason why the Northeast has become 
part of perceptions in the rest of the country is because very young people from the Northeast are to be found in increasing numbers in the hospitality business. They are there, you see the, the cabin crew of many airlines, you find young people from the Northeast. Uh, I've gone to, to hotels across the country and you'll find that again in the lobby, a lot of lobby work is being done by people. Uh, they are presentable, they speak very good English and I, I think one of the reasons there is precisely because they probably went to schools run by missionaries. So that could, that could be one of the, the reasons. So I think overall, it says we've had a, a very comprehensive uh, overview of what uh, awaits the Northeast, what expectations uh, we have from the Northeast, what expectations the Northeast has for the rest of the country. But uh, one point is very clear. Such is the potential that for decades to come, there will be work for everyone. <coughs> There will be work in the area, in the strategic area, there will be work in the economic area, there will be a tremendous amount of work in the cultural area. Um, some of the finest theatre artists in our country have been from the Northeast. Ratan Thiam being the lead, leader of them. Increasingly, you've got many filmmakers who are now coming to the fore. And of course, you had music uh, music uh, people uh, recently. Mubay Nazarika has been once again in a big way. So, I think, you know, instead of talking about, and I agree with you, mainstream and off-stream. I think wherever there is an Indian, there is a mainstream. Exactly. No matter where geographically there is. So there is, there is no such thing as mainstream, there is no such thing as core, uh, etc. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, we have to get Nitin again to speak to us because he's not only a commentator on security matters, and strategic matters, etc. But he has also some very interesting things to say about cricket, <laughs> about cinema, and about travel. Thank you. So hope you'll come back again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pragaukar. Uh, as a tiny token of our appreciation uh, for coming here, may I request Dr. Pragaukar to uh, give a, uh, that's a book. Uh, that's a book about uh, Pune. Uh, oh, and I'm sure that you know yeah, it'll capture many things. I don't know. I won't. I won't. claim that. <laughs> but uh, thank you for that. And uh, I must also thank uh, a couple of people here. Most prominently, the uh, CASS, the Center for uh, Strategic Studies, uh, who partnered with BAC. Uh, we do things uh, together in many ways in a manner that uh, sometimes we take the lead role and end up doing it, sometimes CSS will do it. Uh, while uh, Air Marshal Gokhale uh, couldn't be here, who, who chairs the uh, CASS, there are many, many very senior uh, officers from CASS who are here uh, and who are members of CASS. So, so thank you all for coming here. Uh, we must thank the members of PAC as well. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Kirikar here, we have uh, Mr. Nimbarkar, we have General Mehta. I'm sure there are many, many members here. I wouldn't be able to name uh, each and uh, each one of you. But we're very thankful that it's thanks to you people coming together that shows and that gives the strength and motivation to kind of organize many more of these as we progress. Uh, indeed, there are uh, there are Punekers, the interested Punekers, who would never listen to a to listen to for, whether it's a good music somewhere or it's a good lecture somewhere else. Uh, so we thank uh, all of them for coming here. And uh, if you all give a round of applause for the uh, students from uh, that part of India for an So, thank you so much. Thank you all. And we'll see you again in the next PAS program. Thank you. <laughs>